My favorite passage says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were all meant to shine, as children do. It's not just in some of us, it's in every one of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. And as we are liberated from our own fears, our very presence automatically liberates others. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, uh, it's more. Good afternoon everybody. That's it. I am Sarita Spriggs, a third rotation Capital City Fellow, currently rotating in the Executive Office of the Mayor, Office of the Chief of Staff. And I welcome you to the District of Columbia Government, and I welcome you to today's information session. We are delighted that you guys are here, and we are excited that some of you guys will be coming on board as we are leaving out. So I hope that you get all the questions that you have answered today. And if there is something that you don't want to ask, uh, online, feel free to pull us aside. So we're excited that you're here. Now I have the great honor of introducing Carla Kirby, who is the interim DC Department of, I'm sorry, DC Department of Human Resources Director. And I'm going to read her bio and then she's going to come and greet you. It says that Carla Kirby has over 15 years experience with the district government in human resources management, employee benefits and compensation. Carla currently serves as the Interim Director of DC Department of Human Resources, or also known as DCHR. She joined DCHR in 2007 as the Associate Director of Benefits Retirement Services and has uh, served as the agency's Associate Director of Administrative Services, the Chief Operating Officer, and most recently, the Associate Director of Recruitment and Compensation. Prior to her roles at DCHR, Carla worked for the Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, where she oversaw payroll operations and served as a management trustee on the represented employee pension plan. Um, Carla also served as, um, I'm sorry, I already read that, as, she, I'm sorry, and she also provided oversight for the payroll operations for more than 8,000 employees. In addition to her background in DC government and transit authority, Carla also has significant experience within the private sector. She served, as, she served in various roles with ADP Inc. and Aetna prior to joining the district government. So I would like to introduce to some and present to others, Interim Director Carla Kirby. And I'm happy to be there here this afternoon to um, provide more information about the Capital City Fellows Program. It's been a great way for the district to recruit talent over the past 15 years, and it's been run and operated through our Center for Learning and Development, which is right now held up, run, I'm sorry, by Cheryl Roberson. Where did Cheryl? Cheryl disappeared. Okay, so come to the front, Cheryl. I need you to come to the front. <laughs> Um, it gives an agency an opportunity to tackle some of its difficult problems using specialized skill sets that we get from the fellows. As many of you know, the requirements are that they have an undergraduate and also a postgraduate degree um, in various areas, including masters um, and JD. And I also would be remiss if I did not recognize Ms. Cheryl Roberson for all of her great work that she has done with the Capital City Fellows Program and our CPM program, which we're not going to talk about today, and the fact that she was also awarded one of the K. Fritz Awards for 2015. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time, but I will turn it over to Cheryl, who will provide valuable information about the program. It's something you definitely need to hear, and we would be welcome to have each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carla. Now I need my notes. I wasn't expecting to come <laughs> up here. So they're in the folder on the chair back there. You guys excited? I don't feel any energy in the room. You know, I remember things about Kappa City Fellows applicants, don't I, Sarita? Kareem, you know, so Mamadou, I remember things, right? I may not remember the name, but I always remember something special about you. So again, we're very excited about you being here. It's good to see some of our district leadership um, program interns in the room, so welcome. So I want to talk to you about um, 
the program, but I also want to bring up and have someone to just give a few remarks who is helped sponsoring this event today. Yvette, will you come up, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yvette Lewis with AFLAC, and I just wanted to come and say thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to sponsor this event. And AFLAC has been a trusted benefits partner of the D.C. government for the past five years, and we appreciate the opportunity to provide income protection policies. So for all of you that are currently D.C. government employees, we hope you've benefited from us, and we want you to know that we're here. Now we have one-day pay, so if you have cl need claims, we can, you can get your money back in one day. For those of you that are students or considering coming to the D.C. government, they've got an incredibly rich benefits package here, and AFLAC is part of that package. So thank you very much. We have refreshments outside, so when you, when you do get a break, are they getting a break today? Okay, <laughs> when you get a break, we've got drinks and cookies to help get that energy up. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you, Yvette. Let's give her a hand clap. Thank you. So about the Papa City Fellows Program. Yes, thank you. You all saw, how many of you have already visited our website and saw the information there? Yes. We thank Anita Nunez-Smith for doing an excellent job updating the information about the program as well as updating the information on our fellows, current fellows, and where are they now, those that have moved on to other positions within the district. So you already have seen the applications are open on March 2nd. It will close on April 17th. It will not be an extension to that deadline. So at midnight on April 17th, make sure you have your application in. You can see from the attendants in the room, and we're expecting more people, that this is a well sought after program. And we are excited about getting to meet all of you, either through your application or those that will have an opportunity to be invited to the um, interview process and then those that will be selected into the program. So right now you all on equal footing, right? <laughs> yes, yes. In the way of our timeline, um, the applications in um, uh, on April 17th, between June and July, those of you who will be selected for an interview, uh, we will hold those interviews between June and July. Um, through Also through June and July, we will make selections of candidates um, and you will be notified in August. The program is due to start in October of 2015. So that's the, the timeline um, that we have and that information is also on the website. Why is the Capital City Fellows Program so great? Because it is. <laughs> it's DC government. If you aspire to work in public service, what better city could you come to do that in than here in the District of Columbia? This program has, as Ms. Kirby said, it's been around since 1999. Um, as a matter of fact, one of our um, directors for the Office of Planning was one of the first fellows um, who came to this program. Ryan, not Ryan is there, Eric Shaw. Uh, 14 years ago, he was in the program, he went on to do other things, and now he's back uh, to D.C. government. And when we met with him, he was so excited to be back. D.C. is a great city to be in. We have uh, lots of booming things that are happening uh, in the city, but also D.C. government. It's a great place to work. The benefits are great. You meet great, um, wonderful co-workers. You know, we, we, our team in the Center for Learning and Development, we've been together for a little while now, and we're like family. And we care about the residents of the district. And so if you don't have that, then public service is probably not for you. But if you care about the residents of this city, then the Capital City Fellows Program is a great place for you to start that public service. You learn new things. Um, fellows have worked on um, several projects. How many of you heard of the Capital Bike Share Program? Capital City Fellows really brought that online. They would rotate, and then the next six months, they'd get another fellow and another fellow, and 
we have capital bike share, streetcar, sustainable DC, performance-based budgeting. We could go on and on and on where fellows have touched these very exciting programs. And now with the new administration, fresh ideas, fresh starts, fellows are getting a great opportunity to do even more work in the district and they can see their work. We have had fellows to leave DC government and go to federal government and some of them have returned in the last couple of years. And when I inquired, why do you come back? And they said, because working for DC government, I can see my work. I see how my work touch the people. And federal government is way up here, but I can see how if I'm working on a homeless initiative, if I'm working on affordable housing, I'm working on any of those types of things, I can see how it directly affect the residents of the district government. So that's another great reason um, to want to be in the program. You get an opportunity to explore. You know, maybe you're getting your master's in public health or public administration or law, and you're not for sure what do you want to do with that. You can rotate to three different agencies, get an opportunity to work on initiatives, build your um, toolkit, as I call it, you know, your, your talents and your skill sets, and just decide. We've had fellows to come in, you know, thinking they wanted to do public administration, policy, and they end up doing other things. So it's a great way to explore. One fellow comes to my mind, Matt Scalf, and Matt now is in um, Europe. And when he came into the program, he was like, I don't know what I want to do. You know, he has his master's in public um, administration. I said, you're in the right place. You'll find your passion as you rotate through these agencies. And he did. And he wrote me one day, he said, Cheryl, you were right. I found my passion. I have a passion for human services. And that's what he pursued. So great opportunities, great opportunities um, for you to come. Then we have a com learning and development component. You get to meet with um, senior level officials in the district. We have brown bags with them. It's a great time to hear about their um, career paths, hear about their missions at the agencies that they're leading. You also have opportunity to take classes through our Center for Learning and Development and um, just peer-to-peer -peer learning with fellows. And we have great socials as well. So um, glad you're here today. You're going to get so much information um, when you have from the panel, from the fellows' presentations. And um, we're going to stick around afterwards. So if you want to come up and ask a question individually, you have an opportunity to do that. So we're glad you're here and enjoy the rest of your time with us. Thank you. Now it's time for Real Talk. Everybody say Real Talk. Real talk. All right, so we're going to have a panel discussion with some current fellows and some former fellows as well. So uh, Nick Kushner, can you come on up? Kareem, come on up. And I believe Ted Archer. And how this is going to work, um, they're going to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their cohort year, their agency rotations, their current agency, their current title, and a brief description of their duties. I hope you guys got that. I'll start. I am Sarita Spriggs. I am at cohort year 14. Did we start 14? Yeah, 14. I'm in my third rotation. Uh, I did my first two rotations at the Department of Forensic Science. The first part of my rotation was doing change management and Lean Six Sigma process improvement. My second rotation, I was doing operations. And now I'm in the mayor's office of the chief of staff working on um, laying down a content management system as well as community engagement. So that's me. Ted, pass it to you. Thank you, Sarita. I'm Ted Archer, and uh, I am currently Chief of Staff at the DC Department of Small and Local Business Development. And I am, I think I'm the 10th or 11th year uh, cohort uh, back in 2009. Uh, started my uh, fellows rotation uh, really with the economic development cluster of agencies, uh, the city administrator, uh, the uh, office of the chief financial officers, economic development finance division, uh, the Office of uh, Contracting and Procurement, 
uh, the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, and then ultimately uh, I finished my rotation uh, with DSOBD before I joined full time. Uh, prior to that, uh, I spent a number of years uh, uh, working on several sort of business initiatives uh, in the private sector uh, with H.J. Hines Company in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, and my background is in uh, public administration and public policy, uh, really with a concentration towards analytics uh, and finance. Sure. Good morning. My name is Ryan Springer. Um, I am currently with the Department of Health, Community Health Administration. I was a fellow back in 2005, 2007, and I worked with Department of Health, the Addiction Prevention Recovery Administration at the time. And I actually spent uh, all of my rotations there at APRA. That's where I wanted to be when I came into the program, stayed there for all of my rotations, uh, and fully enjoyed it. Uh, looking forward to really talking with you guys about more of my experiences going forward. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm with the Department of Health. Um, my title now is Senior Deputy Director, and pretty much I oversee five bureaus within, within CHA, and we look at fitness and nutrition, uh, cancer, chronic disease, um, perinatal infant health, um, and so, um, and I'm missing something else. Well, you're good. Yeah, but, you know, so we've got a lot under our purview, uh, to be honest with you, and a lot of needs in the city, and so it's been great being a part of the work of CHA and being able to contribute in that manner. So. Awesome, thank you. Uh, my name's Kareem Marshall. I was in Ted's cohort, the 2009 cohort. Um, I am currently at the District Department of the Environment. I serve as their legislative person, so I write the legislation, I supervise the regulatory process, and I deal with any intergovernmental issues that occur. Um, my fir I only did three rotations. When I started the program, it was still four. Um, I left the program early to work for the city council. Before I entered the fellowship program, I was a prosecutor and um, probably won some cases that didn't really sit that well with me, so I decided that wasn't <coughs> for me anymore. And I left deciding that public policy would be a more constructive use of my law degree. I did my rotations at the police department. That was my first rotation. Um, my second rotation was at the Office of Contracting and Procurement, and my third one was the Office of Administrative Hearings. None of those agencies have anything in common, and the entire reason I picked the three of them was because they would have been stretches for me, things that were outside of the sort of expected purview of what you would do with a law degree. And it turned out to be a tremendously useful experience because each of those rotations gave me the skill set that I needed in order to get the job at the council, which gave me the additional skill set to get the job that I have now. So um, we can talk about like um, rotation selection later. Um, I'm also one of the members of the, uh, the board of directors for, or the advisory board for the Capital City Fellows Program along with Ted. Did I get everything? I think you're good. Okay. Next turn. Cool. Um, so I'm Nick Kushner. I am in the same cohort with Sarita. Um, I'm still currently a fellow. I'm um, kind of in an extension of my second rotation for another week, and then I'll take on a full-time position um, with the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services. So uh, my position title will be a program analyst, which is basically what everybody in that office is called, uh, <laughs> besides the chief of staff and the deputy mayor herself. Um, but the, the kind of purview of that office is it oversees all the health and human services agencies. So the DC Office on Aging, Department of Health, Department of Healthcare Finance, um, Department of the Youth Rehabilitation Services. There's about 11 different agencies that we kind of um, monitor and, and kind of help um, collaborate with one another when we see one agency is working on a project and it would be really good if they kind of talked with this other agency that's working on a similar project. That's the idea behind the deputy mayor's those offices. Um, so I work on an initiative now called Age Friendly DC, which is up here behind you. I don't, I, I think I might give a presentation on this at some point during the presentation. Um, so I'll talk more about that then. Um, and I'll, I'll continue working on that initiative now in my new role. Um, so my first rotation was uh, with Kareem at the Department of the Environment, um, working on a slightly different issue. So I was working with the Sustainable DC Initiative, um, primarily doing outreach and working on a number of task force that were set up, um, interagency working groups to um, kind of dig into issues such as health in all policies, uh, food access and nutrition, healthy by design housing, healthy affordable housing. Um, so every year, one thing that Kareem uh, works on and does an amazing job on is the, this omnibus bill, bill that is uh, presented, um, introduced by the mayor through council um, that includes a number of different bills um, that advance environmental policy in the district. So um, the task forces came out of uh, legislation similar to, to the omnibus, omnibus bill, um, and so we produced reports. Um, in my time there um, on each of these 10 task forces that are now recommendations that are sitting for the new administration and the mayor to hopefully carry out. 
Um, let's see, my background was in urban planning. I went to Virginia Tech uh, in Alexandria. Um, so working on citywide initiatives is, is something that I kind of wanted to get into and have found a really nice niche doing here in DC government. So. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we'll start with the questions and um, each question we'll get two of you to answer so we can get through as many of them as possible. So the first one is why did you choose to apply for this program? Out of all the programs that there are, there are many fellows programs around the nation, but why did you choose this one? Ted, you look like you want to answer it. Of course, Rita. <laughs> <laughs> I, sh I shall. Uh, this program is rather unique in that uh, there is only one District of Columbia, uh, and so the district is unique in that it is not only a state uh, government, but it's a city government, uh, and there are all sorts of sort of quasi uh, from school board uh, to uh, responsibilities that certain federal uh, government agencies place on the district. Um, so there, there are a number of reasons why the district is unique uh, for anyone looking to start their career, let alone start their career in public service. And so um, most of us here are, are, are here and, and chose the program because we have a passion for um, not only doing great work, but doing great work with a social impact, with an impact on things that are, are, are kind of grow beyond you. Um, and so uh, there were a number of us, uh, you know, in, in, in my particular, with my particular background, who looked at programs around the country, um, whether it's the PMF program at the federal level or other sort of city uh, uh, fellows programs. And what struck me about DC, um, in addition to, to some of the hands-on experience that you get, was that I actually had a chance to speak with, um, as you are today, uh, several uh, individuals who preceded me. Uh, and so the, the insights that I received from them certainly led me uh, to believe that I could also be successful here. And so not only uh, was the program well uh, regarded uh, by those who went before me, uh, but their sort of immediate uh, translation into careers was quite remarkable in that I think many of us here, um, whether you're young in your career or, or in the middle or, or even um, perhaps more experienced than that, I think you'll find that the experiences that you get here run the entire gamut and you get to make an immediate impact. And so you won't be, it's, it's not something that uh, I guess we'll get into more details, but it's, it's certainly uh, the kind of experience that you can easily translate into another position. Uh, it's, it's the type of experience that you, after each rotation, should come away with sort of a packaged product uh, that you completed a project or you are well on your way to um, creating something quite new and innovative. Uh, and that's something that is very unique <coughs> for, the, for the district and that program offers that. Awesome, thank you. Kareem, you look like you wanna answer that too. Oh, sure, it be my <laughs> pleasure. Um, well my, Talking to the microphone. So my, my selection process was more personal. Um, as I said earlier, I, had, uh, I went to law school to become a prosecutor. It was the reason I went to law school. It was, that was what I expected when I was like 15. I was like, this is what I wanna do. Um, and the reality of it was not quite in line with what I expected. So I very quickly had to reevaluate what was important to me and why I made those decisions or why I thought I should be a prosecutor and it turned out that I thought what I, what I had was a responsibility to try to improve my family, my neighborhood, the people around me, and my community as a whole. So with a law degree, you have many options. You've got tons of options. Oh, sorry. With a law degree, you have tons of options. Um, you can hang out your own shingle. You can work for a law firm and make a ton of money and then donate. Um, or you can craft policy. So I thought that the, I thought that public policy would probably be the best venue for me, and finding a venue of public policy within which I could affect substantive and meaningful change um, was, there aren't very many opportunities as somebody who's starting their career to actually get the ability to get something where you, where you will own it. And um, this was one of those things that my mentors re reflected on, recommended to me very highly. They said that you'll have the opportunity to own your project, and, and make no mistake, you have the ability to own your project if you have the, um, the desire to own your project. And if you, if you take advantage of that, you have several opportunities that aren't really afforded to people who are already mid-career. It's a really rare opportunity to come into an agency, 
Um, you're non-threatening because you're a six-month employee, so people are really willing to work with you. Um, you have the ability to make mistakes because people are there to guide you. So it was a very rare, um, unique opportunity, and I thought it was something that would not only help me in the short term, but also help me figure out my trajectory for the long term. Awesome. So the next question is, what were the biggest challenges you faced as a fellow, and how did you deal with them? So I guess we'll go with Ryan and then Nick. Sure. Uh, I would guess the biggest challenge, I think, for me was conveying the role of the fellow. I think that was pretty much uh, the biggest challenge walking in the door. And honestly, I see that as an opportunity because you get to craft you know, your role um, in this new agency. You're coming in fresh, and there are all of these opportunities and projects that the agency would like to get their hands on or wrap their hands around and might not have the staffing fully to you know, engage in that project. And you can be a valuable resource. And so I think it's an opportunity for you, whether you're changing careers or for me coming into this, I really wanted to work in the addictions field. To me, there was a significant need that I knew of. That was my, my degrees in public health. I spent my time working in that field and I wanted to work in that field. And so I knew what I could bring to the table with APRA. Um, and so it's really conveying that message and it teaches you then to be your own advocate. You have to advocate for what you bring to the table and also tell that to the needs of the agency. And so uh, that was a great experience for me. And you know, one of the things that I think it's very important as well is as you're getting into this, we look at what other fellows, what advice they have of a, about a particular agency or not. And to me, I, I always caution folks, great to do your homework, do your research, but also understand that opinions are opinions. They're just that. And so your experience could be completely different in another agency. And again, that goes back to you and what you want out of that opportunity and how you drive your time at that agency. So, Good stuff. So um, I think Sarita can relate to this. One of the biggest challenges uh, was just waiting, uh, just waiting to hear. So when we came on, the, the federal shutdown happened. So our yeah. process was delayed for about three additional months. Um, so there was a long uh, period of kind of not knowing what was coming and kind of reigniting a job search again after we thought we had come so far and were at the cusp of becoming fellows. Um, so that was a big challenge. Um, I was so thankful uh, when um, we finally got the word in the official offer letter to, to come aboard. Um, but I think one, one thing that's challenging, um, and it's kind of in any job, but especially with the fellows, is kind of restarting things. So when I, um, my, after my first rotation, I developed really good working relationships with a bunch of people at the Department of the Environment. Um, I enjoyed what I was doing. I loved the projects I was working on. And then all of a sudden, my six months was up, and I had to kind of find a new rotation and then go over to another agency and learn a new set of processes and work with a whole new set of people. Um, and so that can be. Um, a little intimidating and a little challenging at first, but it's really an opportunity. Um, it just grows your network. So um, if you give it time, if you're patient, if you go into every rotation with an open mind, um, you'll, your network will just grow by leaps and bounds. You'll, you, now I have a whole nother um, kind of whole cluster of agencies that I have con contacts with that I didn't have when I was at the Department of the Environment. Um, and it can take time to build those relationships again, but just be patient with your rotations when you go from one to the other. Um, look at them as learning opportunities. Um, and uh, I think that was, that was one of the things. Um, also selecting um, which rotation to go into. It can be a challenge. And a lot of people I know really kind of dwell on this and they're worried that they're gonna make the wrong choice. Um, there really isn't a wrong choice. So whatever you do, um, go in, go in 110 percent, um, and and get everything that you can out of it. There are times when, and it's happened in the fellows program, where for some reason there's um, you know a clash uh, with management. You're not getting the level of support that you need. And Miss Cheryl and Willer are great advocates for you. You can talk to them at any time. They will help you um, work out whatever issues you have if you need to switch from a rotation that you're on because it's just not working out. Um, they'll be happy to help facilitate that. So um, there's really no wrong choices you can make. Just uh, be explorative. Uh, go after what interests you. Um, and I guess that's, I'll leave it there. And he said, be explorative. And some of you guys may have in your mind that I'm going to DDOE, I'm going to Department of Health, and I'm going here. But when I got here, I just knew I was going to DEMPED, and I ended up going to the Department of Forensic Science, and ended up staying there two rotations, and it was one of the best decisions of my life. So you may have in your mind that you're going to this one particular place. I'm going to go here. And you may get there, but 
keep your minds oh keep your mind open and like Nick says be explorative and like uh, uh, Ryan said explore the opportunity because this is one of the greatest opportunities that you will have there's not many places where you can go in and craft your own experience there are some programs like San Francisco fellows they get on one track and they stay on one track you can get here, you can work in business, you can work in public health. Well, you may not be able to transition to public health without having the knowledge, but you can transition to uh, various types of um, agencies. So keep that in mind. All right, next question, and Nick kind of segued into it. It says, what are your recommendations for choosing your agency rotations, especially if they have not hosted a fellow and they think you're the intern? How do you clear that up? Uh, I can start. Um, so. I guess it's a lot of it for me is on a personal level. So um, try to meet with whatever rotation you're considering beforehand. Um, basically, what we say, at least in, in my core, what we would say was if you wait until the day of the meet and greet and the time when all the fellows are there and all the agencies are there and you're meeting, it's too late to really decide your rotation. You should be having conversations with different agency um, directors or staff level management uh, before you're actually going to make your final decision so that you can meet. Um, so just a uh, personal example of when we, if you're selected to the program, you'll get all of your rotation, um, all the potential rotations a few uh, weeks before you actually go to the initial meet and greet. That's, that has contact information for all of the people that will be your supervisors on, that, um, on the proposals. So reach out to them um, and schedule like brief, you know, 15 minute, half an hour, if they're willing to donate that much time. Um, conversations to just talk more what the rotation will be like. Make sure you have a good understanding of where they're coming from, what they'd want to get out of it, and make sure it matches with what you'd want to do. Um, really, that first rotation is the only one that you have to approach like that because you can basically craft your own rotation after that. Sure. So if you make contacts with people in any agency, you can go to a director there or a manager there and say, I'd like to come over here and work on such and such project. Do you think that we could work on writing a proposal for me to come over? Um, so that's an amazing thing no. about the program. Yeah. And most of them are not going to say no because you're free labor, so that's more help around the office. So you become very, very, you look like a gem to them at that time. All right, so the next question is going to be, um, did you decide to stay in one field for all of your rotations versus trying different fields for, with each rotation? How about you, Ted or Ryan? Since I was in one rotation, you know, I okay. stayed with my agency the entire time. Not much I can add on, on that one. Okay. I enjoyed it every time. <laughs> That's <laughs> good to know. Wow. Yeah, I, I think it's a very individualized thing. Uh, you know, I, I'll touch a bit on the, the previous questions for just a second in that, uh, you know, your first rotation, you should be very open-minded because uh, you don't necessarily know where you'll end up. Uh, you, you'll, you'll certainly have a, a say in what your preference is, but depending on the demand for a fellow uh, and the availability of a, of a spot, um, that's where you'll end up. Um, and I have uh, not heard of very many bad experiences. Um, and I would say most of your experiences are, are people driven, um, if that makes sense. So if you have uh, a, a supervisor or a manager that, that helps you feel empowered, that, that you can take a project from soup to nuts, develop it and, and see it through and, and take it with you, um, or if you decide to stay, that's great, then, then that will make for a better experience. Um, and so to, to, to really answer the, the, the question head on, you know, what really makes for uh, the best kind of experience for you is to be open-minded, but also consider that uh, there may be a, sort of a, a, a cluster of agencies that, that may suit your needs. Um, uh, for some people, it was one agency. For me, it was uh, that I knew I had a, a certain passion for economic development, uh, and I chose to sort of remain in that cluster. So my, my immediate network outside of the fellows program became uh, the, the really the, I would consider the, the sexy group, uh, the, the <laughs> people who make the money for the city, and we're, not a, we're a profit center. Um, so that includes DEMPED, uh, the, the Deputy Mayor's Office for Planning and Economic Development. That includes uh, agencies like the Department of Small and Local Business Development, where we help to uh, not only sort of regulate uh, the business activity, but help to create an, an environment where it's good to do business here in D.C., that we attract the right companies, that we retain them, that we help them create jobs. So I knew that that was for me, uh, and so I, I made it a point to, to sort of craft my path around uh, any uh, and all agencies um, that could fit in that scenario. Um, so your, your ideal experience 
um, is very individual, um, and so it includes you really making a list, uh, de defining for yourself how you can be both an asset, uh, be one an asset uh, to the agency, but also that the agency is an asset for you as you pursue your ultimate career path. Good stuff. All right, the next one is gonna be describe the professional development opportunities and the networking opportunities made available through this program. And some of you guys have touched on it a little bit about your networks, but anybody else wanna share? Go ahead. Okay, so to piggyback on what Ted said about being able to be certain about what you bring versus um, being, about being able to figure out what you bring versus what you can get from a rotation, um, just be, be open to the possibilities. The rotation that I thought would be the um, least consistent with my expected career trajectory turned out to be the one that was the most useful for both developing me as a professional and developing my network. Um, I ended up being, the rotation was essentially an interim management program and it turned into more of a audit management system where I was using students who were still trying to get their advanced or their undergraduate degrees, training them up to perform certain tasks that were five to 10 years ahead of what they should have been able to do and then managing them through so that they were able to produce something we would have probably had to pay $1.5 million for. Um, so it was a combination of managing both the product and managing the actual staff. And it was my first actual management experience. It was sold as an intern program. So, so um, keeping an open mind as far as what the opportunity was allowed me to, to sort of reach out and develop both myself and to develop my network but what I got out of that was um, a manager who at the time who was supervising me was a great manager. He, um, he understood the philosophy of management. He understood um, not just how to get the best out of staff from a work product perspective, but to also inspire them to get the best out of others. And that's something that's really difficult in private or public sector. It's really hard to manage people. And whenever you have the opportunity to take advantage of managing something, be it a project or other personnel, take that opportunity because to learn how to do it right makes you really, really valuable. Good stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to add, because you know, when I was a fellow at the time, I was so busy doing the work of the agency, I didn't capitalize, honestly, on a lot of the internal Capital City Fellow networking. But I think what it does is highlights the various opportunities for networking. For me, it was really the stakeholders that we work with uh, at APRA. And from that, that led to my, my next job, actually, outside of the government. I ended up going to nonprofit world for about six, seven years. Um, for the last two of those, I ended up running the nonprofit. And so for me, there's the internal networking opportunities you know, within government, within your Capital City Fellow peers, but then also with the broader external stakeholder network that you're working with. And I think that's very important. I think the skill sets of networking and knowing how to sell yourself, your skill sets, uh, are very important. And this is the place to do it. Uh, as was mentioned before, DC is a very unique place. We serve as local, state, county, you know, everything to everybody here in the district. And so you're not going to get that experience anywhere else. And it makes it challenging because you have these various levels and hats that you wear. But you leave here, you can work anywhere um, in any scenario. That's a conversation I have with our current fellow now. Um, you know, you do this, you can do it anywhere. Um, and that's U.S.-based or international. And I, just a, a couple of things I wanted to add on to. Um, so one of the great opportunities is these brown bag sessions that are organized for fellows. So this is with you know directors of agencies, with the chief financial officer. We get a sit down conversation with the mayor. Um, I mean, these are opportunities to reach out to the people who really run DC government um, and put your face out there, introduce yourself, kind of engage in dialogue, and make sure that your opinions are heard. Um, so it, in the last kind of um, brown bag session that my cohort had, we got to meet with the um, deputy chief of staff for the mayor, who Sarita now works with, um, and we're basically just asked around the table, what should the priorities for DC government be going forward? Because the, the opinions of the fellows is valued that much because we're viewed as silo breakers, so we see you know, government across all of the agencies. We do, we're, not, we're not siloed into thinking of just you know, the Department of Human Services or just the Department of General Services. So um, you can offer a lot um, through those kind of interactions, and with what Kareem was saying, 
if you have a good manager, as a fellow, you have access to top-level management in whatever agency you go to. So take advantage of that. Make a, an appointment with the director of your agency. Schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. You, you should be able to meet regularly with your um, whoever's your manager, supervisor of your um, rotation. Learn from them. Um, you know, pick out the traits that you see that are good management. Um, and then with the Center for Learning and Development, that's another great resource that you have as a fellow. Um, Ms. Cheryl's great about making sure that we are allowed to take the trainings that we want to take. So she'll work to advocate for you to be able to go and take like a two-day GIS course if you want to get training in that, or to go take a project management course. We're also on an elevated level of management um, kind of experience, so we can take some of the higher level training courses, um, which aren't typically going to be offered to entry-level professionals, so. Great advantage. All right, so we have two more questions, then we're gonna wrap up so we can continue. So uh, what was your, some of you guys have landed jobs, or just about all of you guys. What was your experience in looking for a full-time position, and what helped you to get hired? What was your experience in looking for a full-time position, uh, or what helped you to get hired? And I know some of you guys didn't look for it, it came yeah. to you. So you can speak to that as well. So mine's easy, um, I didn't look for it. Um, basically, I work on a project that had a, a baseline funding, um, that we were moving over from one agency, it used to be under the DC Office on Aging, we were moving it to the Deputy Mayor's Office, and we were thinking, how are we gonna spend this $250,000 that we have? And I said, well, you know, um, that's enough to pay a salary. <laughs> uh, so then they started working to write that position into the budget, so that's how mine happened. Amazing. Um, how about you, Kareem? Everybody can ask, answer that. So when we were when we were fellows, uh, we we were still I think we relied a lot on the proposals in order to figure out where we were going. Some of us would reach out to offices and encourage them to write proposals, but I think towards our our last two rotations, we started to have fellows that were along the lines of, "Hey, we want to come to you. What do you need us to do?" Just to have the experience of being in the office. Um, one of our fellows. I think she started on our second rotation, or like halfway through her first rotation, she started lobbying for our second rotation. Um, but for my last rotation, I, um, I picked an agency that hadn't had a fellow in, I wanna say eight years, nine years. So there was no one there who had managed a fellow before. And I wanted a sort of set of experiences. So I was trying to say this without identifying names. Um, so I started interviewing with a bunch of different offices to pitch them the ability to pick up a fellow and I wanted to also have the ability to interact with the city council. Because of separation of powers, fellows don't do a rotation at the council. So I ended up interviewing for an actual job at the council. So I left the fellowship a little early. Um, but that's, that's kind of how it started. Like I ended up switching over to the city council and then after that, I ended up here. Um, I guess the, the easiest way to encapsulate that is you find the positions by one, having um, a good reputation for the work that you do. If you do good work, people will find you. Um, it's, it's really interesting to run into people out in the world and to hear them talk about, like I hear about Ted a lot because he deals with the external universe so, he, extils, he deals, with, deals with the business community so much, he is very well known and very well regarded in the rest of the city. And it's funny because people will talk about you and you won't know that they're talking about you and half of the great things that I hear about him, he probably never hears. So I think the important thing is you don't wanna spend your entire time with your head down on your work, but you do wanna make sure that the work quality that you produce is quality enough so that when people speak about the work that you do, they have favorable things to say about you. Um, so yeah. Good stuff. I told Kareem to say that, by the way. Yeah, Thank he, you, Kareem. He paid him, so make sure you give him his money <laughs> yes, when this is afterwards, over. Afterwards, <laughs> me. Uh, I, the, the first thing I would add is, is let the rotations, uh, let it play its course. Um, let them happen. Uh, if, if your work is, uh, if the time is correct, the timing is correct, and the opportunity is there for you uh, to take advantage of a full-time role, then consider it seriously. Um, but, but certainly let the rotations play out. Uh, and by that I mean, uh, ideally, at the end of four rotations, you may have four job opportunities. Uh, you may have the opportunity to go back to your first rotation and uh, finish what you started. Uh, and so I, I didn't quite do that, um, but, uh, and I didn't quite have four uh, opportunities, but I had quite a few, and it was because I did four rotations. I did four rotations, and for each stop, uh, I, I certainly made uh, enough of an impact in my six months uh, that uh, I was welcome uh, to return. So 
Um, it also it also helps to, and this is not maybe rotation specific, but wherever you are, um, certainly concentrate on your your project, what you own, what you can take away, and what you can leave behind. But um, ultimately, you are there to make your manager look good. It's true. Make your manager look good by performing well, um, keeping them apprised of the work that you do and how it's going to impact uh, their purview in the agency, and you're going to be welcome back in, in some capacity. So. Um, I, I tried to focus on that, uh, and that's you know that that's sage advice that I was given um, years ago. So make your boss look great, uh, and there will be opportunities for you. You've got the best advice you could get. Um, honestly, I, I I recommend everything that they said. I second that. Um, and as I mentioned, you know my next or my job after the fellows program was outside of government, and part of that speaks to what Kareem was discussing. You know, you have to be consistent in having good quality. And that is recognized, and people do talk about you. It's a very small world. Mm -hmm. And in the world that I was in in behavioral health, it's a very small universe. And so the work that I did um, at APRA in the addictions field, a nonprofit that was doing work with the district, you know, recognized that and invited me in to take on a position of director of training. And from there, all of the contacts nationally around behavioral health, many of them touch right back to DC government. And so everybody's watching you, um, you know, so good quality work and be consistent in that. Um, if folks have a need and you have a skill set that can fill that need, do it and do it well. And then don't be afraid to ch tackle things that you don't know a lot about. Uh, when I got to Department of Forensic Science, uh, I went there because uh, the director was just excited about his work and he was also um, telling me about Lean Six Sigma and I studied it in my MBA program but I never really touched it but he gave me the opportunity to study while I was there and earn and learn a whole new field and now I have a new skill set so don't be afraid if you don't have all of the skill sets and if you have most of them it may be something that you want to look into so guys we're going to wrap it up um, so just give them closing advice on just some closing advice sure I'll start um, and I think the the beauty of this program is that folks come into this at various stages so you might have no idea where you want to go this is a great opportunity just to rotate, you know, get, get your feet wet, different areas, figure out what you want to do. You might come in here having an idea, and as, you know, Krita mentioned, that might change completely, or you might be very clear about where you want to be and where you want to have an impact. Um, and, you know, my thing is, if you have a, an idea, an end goal for yourself, whether it's a job or it's skill sets that you want, keep that in mind, because in every rotation that you go through, or whether you stay with the agency the entire time, be open and curious about the opportunities, as long as they're allowing you to get to your end goal. And I'm not saying that to narrow your view, but you've got to have an idea of where you want to be. Um, and it might just be skill sets that you want to learn. Um, and so keep that in mind. And, and you know, approach these opportunities being open and curious. And you know, it'll, be, it'll be good for you. I, I, I've got to say, my experience in those two years um, changed the course of my professional life from there, um, to be honest with you, because of the experiences, the connections. Um, and it really teaches you to just be your best advocate. It, I can't harp on that skill set enough. Um, so, sure. Very sage, Ryan. Um, I would also add, uh, this may sound like a platitude, but, but be a sponge, uh, be an aggressive, humble person. So uh, be aggressive about getting time with people who you can learn from, but also, but also have the approach that you're there to learn. Uh, many of us, uh, I guess millennials, uh, we're accused of being uh, a bit too high strung and a bit too, uh, what's the word, um, entitled? Something like that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, so understand that you have lots to learn. Uh, you certainly can contribute, but you have lots to learn and, and be about um, uh, portraying that to people so they, so they feel as if you can be an asset. Uh, and, and just to add, you know, much of what uh, is going to bring success uh, for you uh, is are things like hard work, uh, are things like showing up on time, yes. you know, leaving after, you know, it's your, your normal duty, tour of duty. Um, you have, wherever you are for that six month period, it's just six months, so you can really, really um, sprint, uh, and sprint hard for that six months knowing that you're gonna be gone. Uh, so there's a lot that you can take away from being a temporary employee, but have the mindset of a full-time employee, if that makes sense. If I had to pick one thing, it would be um, never be afraid to ask. There are going to be, and Nick was really good about this, 
we would have meetings that were just like outside the scope of his rotation. And he would ask if he could come to the meeting and he's a fellow and if we needed additional bodies or additional um, bandwidth on something, it's better to have him up to date than to have to find somebody else in the agency, pull them out, get them up to speed, tell them what their task is, get them to do the test, check it, get it back. If, if, if Nick was already up to speed on something, we could just pull him in and say, hey, we need you to take these three tasks, handle them, get it back to us. And you know, like he had established at that point too that he was going to do good work. So I guess it would be twofold. One, if you know you're interested in something and you're, it's, not, it's outside the scope, just ask for the sake of learning. But also make sure that you're taking care of your core responsibility so that your reputation is intact. Because if Nick had been letting everything else slide and just kind of bouncing around the agency saying, oh, this is interesting, let me learn about this. Oh, that looks cool. Then we would have to say, no, you can't come to any more meetings until you take care of the work you need to do. So go back to your desk, do what you're supposed to do. So I guess the balance is don't be afraid to learn new things, but remember what they expect out of you and make sure that you deliver and deliver well. I think that was well said by everybody. Um, just to kind of kind of drill home the point of kind of keeping keeping that balance and keeping a wide view too of what's going on throughout government. So um, you know you can get kind of inundated with everything that's happening in your agency, but especially if you're a first rotation fellow, like keep thinking about what those other opportunities are, those other projects to work on. Meet with people from those other agencies when you get a chance. Um, it's, it's important to do quality work. It's important to get the tasks that you're assigned in your rotation done and to do them well. Um, and it's just as important too to network and to meet other people and to make sure you're making time to develop yourself as a person. Remember that the fellows program is about you. It's about your development. It's about it's about training the next cohort of leaders in DC government. So um, th they've invested, as they as in DCHR and Ms. Cheryl and DC government are investing a lot of time, energy, and money in helping you get the training that you need to succeed and to help the district succeed. So um, always remember that. Always remember that you should be doing something that's helping your career path. Um, and there are avenues to, if, if you don't think that's happening, there, there are avenues to to um, kind of pursue, not that that happens very much. Um, usually rotations work out beautifully, all of mine have. Um, most people up here I think have. Um, but just always, always keep that wider, always know what's happening within government so you know where you can plug yourself in and be valued. Good stuff. So I'm gonna highlight a few points that they said. Be a sponge, be aggressive, never be afraid to ask, deliver and deliver well. That is very important because there are fellows who will follow behind you. And if you do not do well, then you may not, you may close the door for another fellow. So we always deliver because there are people behind us. So thank you guys for everything. And I wish you guys nothing but much success. So when you're writing those essays and you're coming to interviews, make sure you bring it because you guys are the top in the nation. You're competing with Ivy League as well as local. So I wish you guys nothing but success. And if you get in, or if, even if you don't, feel free to uh, look us up. Thank you. Hi, my name is Akia Leinberger. I am a DCHR's Capital City Fellow. I am going to open the room up to questions for our panel, esteemed panelists. Um, everyone was given a note card. It, everyone was given a note card uh, for questions. If you have them, um, please, you c may stand and ask your question. Yeah, you can, you can just stand and, and give your question. Yes. I can take that. Sure. Um, so the question was, with the administration change, how does that affect your rotations? Um, so we, our cohort just rotated almost exactly at the time of an administration change. So it was really difficult to know um, kind of what proposals would be available even. Um, mostly, most of the directors were changing over. Um, a lot of the offices in the executive office of the mayor were gonna be completely different with completely new staff. Um, so one thing that Ms. Cheryl did um, is plant fellows uh, into the transition team. So we had about three or four different fellows that were involved in transition um, and were helping the Bowser administration as they came in, um, kind of 
in two part advocating for the fellows and also kind of doing the work to help the transition, um, make it uh, a successful transition. Um, and what we did with the executive offices of the mayor is we kind of pushed the, the timeline for the proposal review and writing back a little bit. So um, there wasn't as much time to kind of review pre-written proposals. It was more kind of crafting a proposal. Like if you were interested, we have four fellows I think now that are at the Wilson building. Um, and all of us were interested in particular offices within there. So what we just reached out ourselves um, to staff that we knew were there. I talked to some of the former staff in various offices of the administration and then I talked to the new um, incoming transition staff when they came on and said I had had these conversations before. Do you think this would still be a potential to, to do this rotation? Um, so it's a, it, it does kind of fall a little bit on you to make sure you're proactive if that's what you really want during a transition, but um, Michelle is going to be in your corner. So. Just to supplement that, um, Ted and I, we, we changed rotations during the last administration. Um, you have the, it's an opportunity, just to be clear. It only happens once every four years or eight years, depending on political history, but um, it's rare. A change in administrations is a very rare thing. And um, to have the opportunity to get your foot in the door at the start of an administration is something that, I mean, not every cohort of fellows is gonna get that opportunity. So when it works out in that way, it's, it tends to work out for the best because we have the ability to say, here's a group of professionals that has credentials, a proven track record of work, and they are at your disposal for how you would like to use them. And that's pretty important in the beginning of an administration because the learning curve is so steep. Okay, I have a question from, from the floor. What are some of the things that you would like to see changed in the Capital City Fellows Program? Um, shorter rotations. Um, I, I think it would be really exciting to do, um, you know, little blips of three weeks here, six weeks here, 10 weeks here um, to kind of touch more projects. Uh, there is definitely added value to um, being in the same place for six months and working on you know, a more comprehensive project, but there's also a lot of things that need a fast turnaround and it can grow your network. And I know there are some fellows that have kind of uh, reached out and did slight little mini rotations um, and they've always had uh, really positive feedback on that and have gotten to meet a whole nother slew of um, agency folks that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten to meet. So um, as Kareem mentioned, it used to be a two year program now with the 18 months. Um, it can feel really fast to go through those 18 months. Um, so to just have more opportunities to network and touch different agencies. I'll take the second half of that. How many uh, folks here are interested in the PMF program? Presidential Management Fellows, a couple folks? Well, uh, I, th I think uh, what was under consideration at, at one point was the idea of aligning the, the City Fellows program with the PMF program and that they're sort of our home base established. So if you have uh, an interest in human services or, or health, you'd be sort of based with that cluster of agencies and you'd have the opportunity to learn uh, about all the, the cluster, uh, which could be anywhere between like 10 to 20 agencies. So uh, that's something that I think is still under consideration, but um, you know, part of what makes the fellows program unique is that uh, if you want that, you can probably do that. Um, you can probably establish that for yourself, um, but it's certainly not required or, or mandated. Okay, this goes back to the thing I said earlier about a good or a bad manager. The question was, um, what sort of advanced preparation do you get before starting a rotation? Um, so there are, there are two aspects to that. There's what is the program's preparation before you start, and then what is your supervisor's level of preparation? Um, the, the program has actually instituted an administrative week in between, um, in between rotations now, so that gives you the ability to not only close out your, your prior rotation, but to prepare yourself for the future rotation. So all of the administrative stuff, like setting up your email accounts, making sure your phone numbers work, um, actually making sure that you know where your location is. You can do all that stuff before your rotation actually starts. 
Um, but the actual getting started at your rotation, a lot of that is highly dependent upon your placement. And part of, part of the things you need to be looking for when you select your rotation is the degree to which whoever is your supervisor is actually vested in making sure that you're a success. Um, I have had rotations. My first rotation, it was definitely just sort of show up and we'll figure it out as you go. For my second and third rotations, we spent at least two weeks before I started discussing what we were gonna do, what the expectations of success were gonna be, what my metrics were going to be, what I, what I expected out of them. So the short answer is it's very, the short answer is substantively it depends on your rotation. The longer answer is if you actually put the time in and the effort to set the expectation with your supervisor, you can get the preparation you need, but you have to, you have to take ownership of it to a certain degree. Boot camp is the, the week before you start in your rotations. And they, uh, <clears throat> there are, they info, I'm sorry, they inform you of um, HR procedures, um, the different agencies, the org charts. So there's a whole week where they actually prepare you to understand DC government. They give you a breakdown of acronyms because you will be inundated with acronyms. Um, but after a while, they become easy for you. So there's a whole week, and it's called boot camp, nothing to be afraid of. Um, they teach you about customer care. No, it's nothing to be afraid of. It really is. It sounds a little bit more um, extensive than it is, but it's a whole week of preparation, and it really does prepare you to go into your agency. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add to that. We have agency directors as well as um, training on how to fill out your timesheet, anything of uh, the administrative functions, as well as um, just how we work here in DCHR, as well as how Ms. Cheryl and, the, and our, all the folks that support the, the program work uh, with the agencies. So we have uh, about a week before the beginning of each cohort and in between each rotation, we have at least a few days of uh, admin week. Okay, do I have any, are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. My undergraduate degrees are in biology and information systems, and then I have an MBA. So I have taught science, but I've also worked in IT. So um, I took those various skills and just applied them to the program. So we have people who are lawyers. They have public health. They have those who are in community health, um, education, planners. So it does not matter where you come from. It's what you do with what you have. So that's, that's all I have to say today. And proposals come from all over DC government. So whether you, no matter what degree you have, there will be a proposal that will match up with what you would want to do potentially. Uh, is there is there an area that you have that you have a degree in that you're wondering about specifically? I can also answer that. Yeah. We have project proposals from the uh, DCPS as well as Executive Office of the Mayor, um, Deputy Mayor for Education. So, yes, we do. So if you, are in, if you are, have a teaching background and you would like to go into administration or working on um, information systems, data and analytics, or programming, uh, we have a lot of opportunities. You have the option of developing your project proposal with staff and senior level officials in the agencies or the administrations. Yes, uh, just that uh, there have been at least a couple, I think, Teach for America um, folks who've joined. 
Uh, and education, I mean, I think that just, that cuts across a lot of different disciplines. Um, what's the saying? It's those who can do, those who can't do teach, those who can't teach administer or board administrate. So we're all administrators here, so, right. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think your background is, is well suited to, to sort of delve into this as well, but uh, there is a huge disparity uh, in education uh, and it's not just sort of public school education, it's, it's education around disciplines. Uh, and I, so I think that would certainly be um, a great asset to the program. Yes, sir. Okay, the question was, could you tell the gentleman or the audience about the application process and how you approach the application process? That might actually be better for Michelle, for her to talk about the application process. We can talk about how we actually approach it. <laughs> I, sure, I, I can at least give, I can give a quick, before you give the, the, the nuts and bolts, just uh, take it extremely seriously. Uh, these are all competitors in the room. Uh, they're cutthroat. You know, they're going to be, they're going to spend hours and hours putting together a great proposal. Uh, and so I, I treated it like it was a thesis, you know, so get people to read it, um, spend time on it. Uh, certainly, I think there are letters of recommendations involved in it as well. So pick people who you've invested in and they've invested in you. Um, so yeah, take it extremely seriously and, and get people to, um, get others to, to, to sort of provide their insights as well. Don't just send it in cold. Just want to say one thing about letters of recommendation. Um, <laughs> please don't pick somebody that doesn't know you, <laughs> um, and don't pick someone that doesn't write well. Like it should be someone that knows you, someone that can attest to your ability to work, and someone that writes well. And granted, I would think that these are things that don't need to be said, but I just want to make it absolutely no, clear. No, they need to be said. Okay. Well, yeah. then, yes. Please, please pick people. Please pick people who can reflect well upon your capacity. There's nothing worse than looking at. And this is not just for the program, this is generally, there's nothing worse than looking at a strong applicant that just got weak people to write their recommendations. And if you need to start cultivating that now, have a couple of catch-up coffees, a couple of phone calls with your, your thesis professor from college, start that now, because you have enough time. But if you wait until like the day before the application is due and you're like, hey, um, I know I haven't talked to you since freshman English, but uh, I got this recommendation that I need tomorrow, can you take care of me? Your, your recommendation will reflect the amount of thought and preparation you put into it. Can, can I just add, you are, you are investing two years of your life in you and in your professional development. Take the time to put together a stellar application, get good recommendations. I mean, it's a significant opportunity and a significant investment of your time. Um, take the time, be thoughtful about it. I, I just wanna add to that. Um, I think I said earlier that we get lots of applications. Um, we have gotten as much as 300 applications for this program in one Sorry. recruitment year. And we only bring in 15 people. Right there is competitive. But the first screening is a resume that has typos, mm -hmm. incorrect grammar. So make sure your resume is tight. Let someone else read it. Because the first thing we will do, if the resume is not tight, you know where it goes. And we move on and keep moving it. So please take what they said. This is a very competitive process. It's a very competitive program. We're looking for great candidates. And great candidates start with what we see and learn about you first. And that's what we see on paper. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So to repeat the question, um, there were, I, I, I spoke earlier about having a first rotation that just kind of went with the flow and you learn as you go. 
and a couple of other rotations that were a lot more deliberate about what was expected of me and what I expected of them. This is a personal preference. Um, I found the, the go with the flow approach to be personally painful, um, but this is how I am. I'm a planner. Like I, I plan things out multiple months, multiple years in advance if I can, and, but that's a personal preference. So you have to know that about yourself. If you're a free spirit and you work well within an unstructured environment, then you would probably want a manager that is consistent with that. It, it's, it's about workplace fit. So be honest with yourself. And if, you, if you're a person that aspirationally would like to be a good planner, but you're really quite messy, don't put yourself in a circumstance where you're with somebody like me who's a really hard-nosed planner, because it, it'll be tough for me, it'll be tough for you. Um, so if you're honest about what you want, you'll know what fits best for you. I learned that, um, I learned that an experience where you aren't planning is something that is painful for me. So I know that now, and it not only informs the way I work, but it informs the way that I work with other people, and it makes everyone's life easier. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an individual preference. An additional perspective. Um, because I, and I agree, and I'm, I'm not the planner. That's not me. I hire folks who have a type person. We were just talking about it on the way up here, actually. Um, but at the same time, I think having the different experiences, like that's life. When you go into any new job, you might have a great intro where folks are very thoughtful about it. In other instances, it won't be. It might be project-based. And so I think what it does, again, is it's just about you and your development. And it's challenging you to figure out how can you best respond to? Because although you didn't like it, you had to figure out a way to make it work. Um, and again, to me, it keeps coming back to what do you want out of this experience and how can you make the best of it? Because there are many times, and I mean, when I was here, it was 05, and honestly, my memory's horrible, so I don't remember the details, but there were folks who had challenging rotations. Some made it through and turned them into great rotations because they saw a way to do that and they took the initiative to do that. Others didn't. And I'm not saying that in some cases that you can salvage it, some you can't, and so you take action and move on. But I think it's just a matter of life is not going to always be, you know, this nice package of that transition, and so you've got to figure out how to make do. Um, yeah. And just to add another uh, little bit onto that, um, so the time when you review proposals before you actually select which ones is a great time to ask some of these questions and to really go through the proposals and not just read what's in the proposal, but if there's a plan mentioned or an initiative mentioned, go online and look that up. See if it's something that you'd be interested in working on. See kind of what the history is behind it. Um, and then so that when you sit down with the, peop with the supervisors at the day, um, of the meet and greet, you have questions that you know you want answered and, and you can speak intelligently about the proposal, so. The last thing I wanna add, I'm not for sure if we mentioned it, but we have what's called a meet and greet. A meet and greet. And the meet and greet is an opportunity for fellows and agency reps to come together and talk about the proposal that they've submitted. The great thing about it is that you can read on paper and you maybe have a conversation over the phone with them, but when you come together, they get to know more about you, you know, just you know, talking to you about your experiences, your aspirations, as well as you get to know more about the agency. And sometimes what has happened that fellows have gone into the agency not to work on the proposal that was submitted, but through conversation, they've crafted some other work and you know, the fellow decided to go to an agency based on the work that they were able to come, projects they were able to um, come up with together. So the meet and greets are very, very good. You know, it was an opportunity to meet agency reps and meet, and not only if you don't go to the agency, but it's a networking. You'll be surprised as fellows cross agencies in their work. Um, I was at a symposium last September uh, with other fellowship programs throughout the United States. And one of the things that fellows said from all those programs is, we can get things done that our directors can't even get done in our cities. And it's because a fellow at one agency know a fellow at another agency and so on, and they can get answers to things. So you get an opportunity to you know, cross collaborate with um, other agencies so you never know when that person that you met at the meet and greet, you'll have an opportunity to interact with them again. Thank you. Do we have any additional questions? Yes, sir.
Um, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, you can have my contact information. Um, so the question was, uh, aside from asking for my contact information, <laughs> was as someone who is pursuing a law degree, um, who also went to my alma mater, he wanted to know what he would recommend as far as, what I would recommend as far as potential rotations. Um, my experience with MPD was very unstructured, but it was, I think, the most professionally useful of my rotations. I grew in my other rotations more, but the job that I'm doing now, I learned how to do at MPD. So that was, not to say that it was a bad rotation, I don't wanna give that impression. It actually was a very educational, um, it was a very educational experience, particularly because MPD is such a large entity and has such a complex budget that if you can prepare for performance oversight in that agency and prepare for budget oversight in that agency, you can do it anywhere. Like it's, it's got like 3,000 plus sworn officers, another 200 um, civilian per personnel. Like it's just, it's such a big entity that getting your arms around that makes, like my, my agency's 300 people and it's a relatively larger agency for some, it's like a mid-sized agency, but it's not that hard to manage all of our data because I've done something that's 10 times as large. Um, so what I would recommend individually for you, it really depends on what you would want. And if that's an offline conversation, if you'd like to have it, but if any of you are trying to figure out what to do regarding the training that you have and then fitting it into the experience that you're gonna have in the fellowship program, I would reiterate what's been said earlier. Both keep an open mind for the experience and enjoy it, but also be deliberate about what you're doing. So I know that's a non-answer, but that's the best answer I can give you without knowing more. One last question here. Can I just jump in and say, I think Ms. Cheryl would say that any time a Capital City Fellow gets hired, it's good for the Capital City yeah. Fellows program. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's the end goal for all of us. Um, so the question was, uh, you know, people that leave early um, before their three rotations are up and they take a job, is that um, good for the Capital City Fellows program or not? And, you know, what are the benefits of leaving and, and taking a job as opposed to finishing out the rotations? Um, and, and I think it depends on the person. Um, I think it, it depends too on, on your needs. Um, you know, if, if you have um, more income needs than, you know, uh, staying a fellow for longer and you really are hoping to get into uh, a full-time position. Uh, one of the great things about the fellows is you typically enter um, at at least a 12 uh, s career service level. So it's a pretty significant pay raise when you get a job. So that's a huge incentive um, to get a job. Um, and I mean, as long, a lot of times what I found is, because I left a little bit early before my last rotation, and I am involved in a lot of interagency efforts. I've met a lot of people. I feel like my network is really good. I didn't, I, I felt like personally I reached a place where I didn't need to um, have a totally different experience again. I had found something that I was really interested and comfortable in doing and felt like I had a network enough around DC that I could do what I wanted to do really well. Um, and could bank on my previous fellow's experience. And so the timing for me was just right at the time. Um, and I think that's an individual decision, as we've said a lot, um, but I don't know. Well, we really want fellows to stay in the program at least a year. Mark, sorry. Um, to stay in the program at, at least a year, um, because for continuity of the program, however, um, when the economy and jobs weren't as plentiful, we relaxed a little on that, so if a fellow got hired in a nine-month period or whatever, we weren't gonna tell the fellow, no, you can't take a job. So, um, but that's, that's our goal. We like for fellows to stay at least two rotations, and if there, if there is an agency in their second rotation that's interested in hiring them, we, we're very happy about that. Thank you. There's, there's also a baseline level of professionalism with this. It, it's one thing to take a job, it's another thing to disappear. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, candidly, 
it, it's a free market. You can work wherever you want to work. However, um, you're making a commitment. The expectation is that you will at least honor that commitment for the first year. And if you have an opportunity during your third rotation, it's great for you to take that opportunity because if you get a job in the district government, you're helping the fellows brand. So you win, we win. Uh, functionally, regarding the full-time equivalent, when you if you leave before your term is expected, it creates an awkwardness in budgeting, but you don't have to worry about that. That's so not your problem. <laughs> but just, just keep in mind that like, like when I left, I left after my third rotation and I timed it so that I started at the council when I would have started my next rotation. But the entire time I was having the discussions on whether or not I was gonna take a job at the council, I was still in contact with the Office of the Attorney General because they were expecting to be my fourth rotation. So I let them know that I had a full-time offer on the table. I was debating whether or not I was going to take that job. So it wasn't a, oh, a fourth rotation started. Kareem's supposed to be here today. Like they, they knew that I wasn't coming. They knew, I told them before I made my final acceptance, when I told them when I was still negotiating with counsel. So they knew, they knew that it was coming. They knew it was a possibility. So just be professional. Okay, thank you, um, panelists.